Hello and welcome to CSSC Encounters. My guest today is Jonathan Lesh. I'm very pleased to have you here as the new president of Hampshire College. Uh, and we will go there uh, in a minute because uh, you arrived here with a bit of a bang, mm -hmm. having uh, former Vice President Al Gore to be your opening speaker or your uh, inaugural uh, speaker. Uh, but before, you also have been involved in a couple of things which are worth mentioning. Uh, you've been for about 18 years uh, uh, the president of the World Resources Institute, a very important, uh, what you call a do tank, uh, a think tank on uh, environmental issues. And you've obviously, with your uh, institute, uh, gradually broadened the spectrum from uh, mainly American-based to a more global uh, active uh, uh, environmental uh, group of uh, lobbyists and advocates for uh, social change and climate change in particular. But uh, you also have a background in governmental uh, activities. You were the chair of the Clinton President's uh, uh, Council on Sustainable Development and before the time even uh, worked for the governor of Vermont on environmental issues. So a lot of uh, environment uh, in your uh, background and history. And so uh, by way of an opening uh, question, I would like to hear from you what you consider to be your major achievements in that uh, area. You know, I got into environmental issues just because I'm passionate about them. Mm -hmm. um, I was just coming back from the Peace Corps when Earth Day took place, and it caught my imagination. The, the, the issues of pollution and destruction of resources that people were protesting in the first Earth Day seemed like outrages to me and made me angry, and I wanted to find some way to work on those issues. Uh, and I had, I had a very good time working in Vermont. I uh, worked for a wonderful governor, Madeleine Kunin, who came to office as a reformer in a state that with very strong uh, environmental values. Mm -hmm. And working with the legislature, we managed to uh, pass uh, statutes on things ranging from clean water to trash disposal to clean air. Um, and I really uh, am proud of that record. Uh, and of what the people of Vermont did because they are so committed uh, to maintaining a state whose, whose value uh, is very much expressed in the quality of its environment. Yeah, or nevertheless, Vermont Yankee was still open. Vermont Yankee was open when I got there and still open when I left and, and I signed one round of uh, discharge uh, permits uh, for them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at that time, Vermont Yankee was a relatively consistent, clean source of power. The problems with the plant really emerged later uh, right. when they switched operators. Um, the company that owns them now doesn't have a fabulous record in terms right. of plant operation. And it's also becoming a pretty old uh, plant uh, in technology uh, terms. It is. Uh, an old plant. Um, it is sited in a place that uh, I find uh, troubling. Um, it uh, now has a, a history of failures in crucial parts of the, the plumbing, so mm -hmm. I've been very sympathetic with the efforts of the state not to have it relicensed. Right. And then you moved on to the World Resources Institute and became an advisor to President Clinton and that's how you also probably got connected to other uh, major players in the field. So what are your uh, achievements and uh, accomplishments there? Well, there's one set of achievements that were, were inward focused on the organization. I took over an organization that was a classic think tank. I had very smart people with PhDs mm -hmm. doing studies on global environmental issues whose objective really was to put those issues on the global agenda, to get world leaders to start talking about trends that we thought would change the future of the Earth. And I came just at the time of the Earth Summit in Rio, and in a sense, the Earth Summit in Rio was the moment at which global leaders finally recognized those right. issues. And 
I tried to shift the organization to, as you said in your introduction, from being a, a pure think tank to being a do tank, uh, an organization that, that used its analytical capacity to create actual changes in policy and practice. Mm -hmm. And it, we created a new model uh, in doing that um, and got to be very sophisticated about how we measured results. So uh, I tried to move to a, a management approach in which all of the experts, all of the analysts that we had were accountable for producing real results on the outside of the organization. A report wasn't enough. The report had to lead to some change. Mm -hmm. um, At what level? At uh, all levels of society? or Sometimes, sometimes global, sometimes local. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, we worked with ultimately a, a group of uh, over 300 companies developing the accounting standards by which all companies now measure their greenhouse gas emissions. Right. Very important as you begin to try to negotiate a regime to control those emissions, and there was no such right. a agreement. Uh, that standard is now the one used by governments all over the world, and in places where marketplaces have been set up to trade reductions in right. pollution, it's that measurement standard that's used for the marketplace. So you're referring now to the gre uh, greenhouse gas protocol, the right? The greenhouse gas measurement protocol, which for anybody who knows something about accounting, it's the FASB standard yeah. for greenhouse gases. Uh, it's also led thousands of companies to begin voluntarily reporting their emissions and voluntarily reducing their emissions, which was a big step. Yeah. So. Something ranging from that to changes in fishing practices in island nations that have saved uh, reefs in critical places where it's really been a partnership with a local community doing uh, an experiment in uh, conservation right. valuation. So uh, you indicate that you're basically working with all kinds of partners, uh, government-based, uh, business-based, uh, civil society, NGOs. Uh, I assume that you uh, identify the partners and the networks in which you uh, or the Institute wants to work uh, on the basis of the topic of the, the project involved, right? So at some times uh, you need uh, to be more closely allied to a business and other times it's much more uh, a community-based kind of advocacy work. That, that's exactly right. It's a very pragmatic and very mm. strategic decision. So, and how do you keep your own sanity? How, how do you draw the line of uh, engaging versus uh, becoming absorbed or uh, part of the dirty uh, environment? The key is to be very specific and very concrete about what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal is uh, to create an honest measurement standard for greenhouse gases. Who can, who can create that change? Mm -hmm. How can we engage them? Do they have a set of interests that overlap with our interest in making that happen? As long as we stay very focused on that goal, it's quite comfortable working with them. As soon as we become more interested in the relationship than the outcome, it becomes very dangerous. Right. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, fortunate to listen in to a presentation you made just a few days ago at the uh, Global Citizens Leadership uh, Seminar, and you gave there an interesting case about Cameroon and the tracing of uh, illegal logging, etc. Uh, I uh, walked away uh, then from with the impression that uh, uh, you see up to a certain point the value of uh, the self-regulatory uh, uh, attempts by the market and by the, the business. Am I wrong in my conclusion here? I, I would put it a little differently, Jan. I see the power of markets to shape behavior, mm -hmm. and I uh, enjoy the fact that it can create very rapid uh, changes with relatively uh, low transaction costs. So right. the case you were talking about we're essentially using the capacity of satellites to track 
um, uh, what's going on on Earth doesn't have to be just tracking uh, Iranian nuclear programs. It can be illegal logging. Mm -hmm. And linking that to the fact that there's a strong push among consumers to avoid unsustainably harvested wood. Right. And as a result, big companies that are buying wood are trying to, to be green. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can harness those forces to information, you can create pressure on the people who are actually operating in the woods. And that can be successful even though, as our colleagues said in, in that seminar, the government in the actual place is either doesn't have the resources right. to enforce the law or is too corrupt to enforce the law. Right. Ultimately, government has to put the rules in place. Government has to keep the marketplace open and fair. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I hear you saying is that there is always a play between tactics and strategies. And the ultimate strategy may uh, be in the back of everybody's mind, but the tactic to get there is also important. Yes. And after 40 years of working on environmental problems. Mm -hmm. I'm very partial to strategies that produce results and whose results can be measured. Right. I, I want to feel that something has actually changed. So back to what you said before, uh, it's you are part of a do tank rather than a think tank. Or you have a moved away from the only thinking and uh, emphasize also the implementation of what uh, you try to uh, advocate for. Something very interesting that happened for an analytical organization moving to uh, a system of management for results mm -hmm. that didn't measure outputs but measured outcomes mm -hmm. was very difficult because the analysts who work for me are extremely good, or w when I was doing that, who did work for me, were extremely good at uh, analyzing policies or looking at data on trends in natural resources, but had no experience in planning strategy and measuring results. Mm -hmm. So it, it was uh, an arduous process getting that system in place. It took five years or so. Right. After we did, um, the organization began to grow remarkably fast, uh, doubled in size and then doubled in size again. Yeah, and that's partly thanks to your own leadership, I would say. Uh, and there's nothing wrong about uh, such kind of an approach in general. But then the next question comes to mind, uh, why leaving yeah. this uh, successful ship and joining a small campus uh, somewhere in the midst of nowhere? So um, the this, this story is actually quite funny. I had absolutely no thought of leaving. It, it was a fabulous job. I worked with exciting people ranging from the chairman of General Electric to the president of Brazil on programs around the world that I cared about mm -hmm. deeply. And one Saturday morning I was sitting and clearing my email uh, and I saw an email from one of those headhunter firms, but you know we all see them from time to time, and I, I I think I must have deleted an average of 10 a week for years. And it said Hampshire College, and for some reason I, I don't, I, I can't identify, I actually opened it. And I remembered that a very good friend of mine named Adele Simmons had been president of Hampshire College in the early days. And she went on to become president of the MacArthur Foundation. Right which was a major funder of the World Resources right. Institute. So we met and worked together a lot, and I really thought highly of Adele. And so I called her, and I said, "What's? I, I just got this email about Hampshire College. Tell me something about that. And she said, would you consider doing that? And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, and she began campaigning to get me to apply for the job. Small world. Small world. And then... I thought, well, at least I'll go meet with the search committee. So my wife and I flew up to Boston. Um, we actually came up here without telling anybody and toured around. It was a dreary, dreary March day. <laughs> and then I went and met with the search committee in Boston, kind of thinking, this is crazy. I can't do this. And there were four students on the search committee. And 
everybody else, there, there, the, the search committee had about 20 people, but everybody else was deferring to the students. And they were smart and tough. Uh, they asked very good questions. They asked me follow-up questions. They didn't accept my answers. Uh, and I just loved them. And I th had the thought, you know, I've been working on environmental issues for 35 years. And during those 35 years, on a global scale, everything I've been working on has gotten worse. And I'm not going to get this done in my lifetime. And these students might actually be able to do it. And what better thing could I do for the next five or 10 years than help them become mm -hmm. more effective? Um, so I really fell in love with the students. I came out of the interview went to meet my wife, and in about 10 seconds she said, you're going to do this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, and here you are, but uh, did I sense in your answer a bit of a disappointment about your past? Well, um, yes, if I'm at all honest, mm -hmm. I have to say for all of the individual successes of projects I've worked on, um, overall the trends have gotten worse faster. So greenhouse gases are building right. up in the atmosphere more quickly. Um, the destruction of reefs is accelerating. Uh, the loss of species is continuing unabated. I you can't really say if it's accelerating because we don't have accurate right. enough information. Um, tens of millions of people around the world are affected by uh, pollution. Um, that's not a great record no. of achievement. But that, and, and uh, looking at, at the country at the moment, uh, we still find quite a number of uh, climate change deniers among our, uh, in our midst. So um, do I take it that uh, you look now at the next generation, the future generation, through education as an option? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying it enormously. I continue to find the students um, challenging, open-minded, passionate, um, optimistic that they can make a difference, and I just love working mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, and of course, that's also one of my uh, drivers uh, for uh, continue being active in, in education. But at the same time, uh, uh, we also often see the enthusiasm of students not being translated into, uh, yeah, practical kind of uh, options or uh, being overly uh, ambitious and uh, as a result uh, not getting there. Um, so what kind of uh, advice are you uh, coming with and uh, trying to quote unquote teach them? Um, well, I'm not teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sitting on a few uh, committees for students in their, their last yeah. year. Uh, but I'm trying very hard to answer your question in terms of the direction for Hampshire right, overall. Right. So this is a, a school that prides itself on uh, learner-centered -center, education, on challenging students to design their own curriculum, to identify the questions that matter to them and find out how to pursue those questions. Interdisciplinarity? It, it, yes. um, their students are completely free to cross disciplines mm -hmm. and do constantly. And one of the things we find is that the students who get through the program become very entrepreneurial and very comfortable with change because they've had to approach professors, persuade them to serve on committees, then persuade them that this was a relevant question and design a curriculum with them. And, and they just have to become independent right. and self-sufficient. What I worry about is that we're not, in the culture we've created, in the way we operate, um, we're not doing enough to challenge students to think about issues around sustainability and, and social change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that the school can move quite quickly. We're in a wonderful position. We have a 250-acre farm right. that's been there for a long time. Uh, we have a faculty that is very open to ideas about connecting the way we live to the way we teach. My goal is that we'll create a culture of sustainability that will be reflected in, in operations, mm -hmm. 
in the way we feed ourselves and all of those will become part of the curriculum. There'll, there'll be really no bright line between right. what's operational and what's academic. So an integrated approach to education but also to living in that community. Um, yes, so that you, even if you're an artist, you can't go through Hampshire without having lived within and thought about what a culture of sustainability mm -hmm. is. And if you're interested in sustainability, you are deeply exposed to the role of the arts and humanities in defining culture, mm -hmm. which after all is sort of the key to the sustainability problem. Right. And uh, given the wider community, we are here with five other colleges in the, the valley. We have a very vibrant uh, kind of community life, so to speak. Uh, uh, any connections there? Any uh, projects uh, which you would like to initiate uh, in that regard? It, that was something that was a complete surprise to me. I, I hadn't understood what a rich opportunity this valley presents. Um, the, the five colleges all share this set of values around mm -hmm. issues that I care about. Um, they have enormous intellectual uh, resources, um, fabulous student resources, and we're in a setting which um, is doing some of the most innovative work in the country in terms of organic agriculture, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about the ways people feed themselves. Um, and offers wonderful opportunities to connect to Holyoke and Springfield in terms of sustainability. Uh, I was very encouraged with the results of the process that uh, we launched last fall, the, the Blue Sky Brainstorming, right. uh, where we asked uh, students, faculty, staff to suggest ideas that the five colleges co collaborate on that would make a real difference on sustainability. And I had hoped we might get a few dozen ideas. We ended up getting over 570 mm -hmm. and are now trying to set up courses in which students will evaluate those ideas and get to present them to the five college directors. Wow. So that suggests the kind of richness. That's out yeah, there. it sounds also like a bottom-up kind of strategy to get everybody involved in yeah. the uh, ultimate exercise. And hopefully to also make it a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, what could be more fun than to be working on economic valuation, knowing that you're going to get to present it to the presidents of the, the five institutions? Right. I uh, am impressed uh, with your uh, ambitious plans, but uh, given your background and the success you've already uh, have shown uh, in your previous uh, endeavors and activities, uh, I'm sure that uh, some of it will uh, come to fruition. Thanks for uh, uh, your acceptance of uh, this challenge as the president of Hampshire College. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. And I'll thank you for your interest. I uh, want to challenge you to breathe life into that phrase. We know about the injustice in the world and we know that it's not enough to simply know about it. I have seen in my lifetime examples of college students taking inspiring, motivating leadership roles in bringing about needed change in this country. I grew up much of my life in the American South, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. The lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville were led by students your age. The, the demonstrations in many parts of the South that awakened the conscience of this country were led by students. And in, in my generation, I was somewhat younger than those who were leading uh, that movement. I remember so clearly how my friends and I would ask our elders, now tell me again why it's okay to have laws that discriminate against Americans on the basis of their skin color when, when our elders 
could not answer that question, change began to take place. I remember uh, when I was older watching college students take on the evil system of apartheid in South Africa. I joined the board of a college in order to be a part of that movement, but long before I put my shoulder to that wheel, Hampshire College in 1979 was the very first school in the United States of America to divest from South Africa. I remember that during those years, the struggle sometimes uh, seemed almost hopeless. There were times during the civil rights movement when the goal seemed so far away. Dr. King once said, how long? Not long, because no lie can last forever. We see policies today, practices and common behaviors by governments and corporations that we know are wrong. 